Thank you very much. It's, it's a real privilege for me to be here again in, in the law school, indeed right in the same room where I spent a happy week teaching in 2010. <coughs> and particularly it's a real privilege for me to take my place in the interesting and distinguished sequence of Coxford lecturers. And I'm very grateful to those who've made this possible. This, this occasion has for me the bonus that it allows me to recount for the first time anywhere the opportunity I had to participate in the making, for better or worse, of Canadian history and destiny in the unique event of the patriation of your country's constitution. A constitution transformed in the very same process by the engrafting onto it of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And it turns out that uh, this is particularly appropriate because Stephen Coxford was himself in England, uh, in Cambridge, in the College of, and very close to um, uh, uh, the, the head of the college who will, uh, who will figure in my story. Tonight's account then may be the first time as it happens that any non-Canadian involved in these events and processes as they unfolded in London between October November 1980 and February 1982, the first time that such a person has given an ordered account of the events. And I don't expect that many or perhaps any more accounts will be given by those non-Canadians who have survived the intervening three or more decades. Given the affair's complexity, I'll have to be very brief this evening and hope to fill out and document the story in your valuable Canadian Journal of Law and Jurisprudence. Patriation, as you all well know, was the transferring to Canada, to persons, institutions and processes in Canada, of all the powers of legislating for Canada that had remained with the United Kingdom Parliament in and after 1931. The Statute of Westminster 1931 enabled Canada and other dominions such as South Africa, New Zealand and with qualifications Australia to make laws prevailing over United Kingdom statutes and it eliminated or severely qualified the power of the United Kingdom Parliament to make laws changing a dominion's law. To those general empowerments of the dominions there were exceptions some in relation to Australia, to preserve its six states from being absorbed without their consent into a more unitary structure by legislation of the Australian Parliament alone, or of the UK Parliament acting alone or at the behest of the Australian Government. And a further exception, section 7, subsection 1, to preserve the exclusive authority of the UK Parliament to amend the key provisions of the statute by and under which Canada had been constituted and ruled in and since 1867, the British North America Act 1867 as amended. This retention of legislative authority by the UK Parliament was not in any sense or way whatsoever an expression of some British desire to retain some hold over or influence in Canada. On the contrary, Section 7 was insisted upon by all political players in Canada and its terms were drafted in Canada and were approved unanimously by all the provincial governments at a conference assembled in Ottawa for the purpose eight months before the enactment of the Statute of Westminster in December 1931. Everyone at the time expected that within a few years it would be possible for the federal and provincial governments in Canada to agree on some intra-Canadian method of amending Canada's constitution whereupon that method would be given statutory form and authority by a final UK statute which would itself also enact that the powers of the UK Parliament to make laws for Canada were terminated. Such a statute with these two elements and effects, terminating the powers of the UK Parliament to amend the Canadian Constitution and creating an intra-Canadian method for amending it, would be a statute patriating the Canadian Constitution, or rather, as people said in the 1930s and right down to the 1960s, it would be a repatriation of it. 
As things turned out, however, it took over 50 years to achieve this. Patriation was accomplished eventually by the Canada Act 1982, the UK Parliament's final statute for Canada, and one that included not only those two elements, but also a third, a Charter of Rights and Freedoms. All three elements having been requested of and drafted for the UK Government and Parliament by joint resolution of the two houses of the Canadian Parliament. After the failure of intergovernmental conferences in the summer and September of 1980, the Canadian government had announced such a resolution on 2nd of October 1980 and tabled it in that parliament on the 6th of October. Mr Trudeau's announcement was opposed within three weeks by six and eventually by eight of the provinces, all except Ontario and New Brunswick. The provincial objections concerned two of the three elements of patriation, the formula for post-patriation amendments of the Constitution and the inclusion of a Charter of Rights, judicially enforceable against not only the federal authorities but also the government and legislature of each province. On the day the patriation package was announced, the Canadian government also published a background paper entitled Patriation of the British North America Act. In 25 meaty and, in a literary sense, lucid paragraphs, it offered to explain the relationship between the Canadian and UK United Kingdom parliaments in connection with the patriation of the Constitution of Canada." Unquote. It purported to have been prepared by the Department of External Affairs, but probably it was in fact prepared by the Ministry of Justice team, headed at officers level by Professor Barry Strayer. He had been working on patriation off and on for about 20 years, first for the government of Saskatchewan, but since early 1967 for the government of Canada, not least for Pierre Trudeau, the Minister of Justice, Minister for Justice. He, Strayer, published last year a notable book, Canada's Constitutional Revolution, describing Canada's path to patriation and the Charter since 1960, and indeed before, with much revealing detail about his own involvement in that process, an involvement beginning not long after his return from studying law in Oxford. He describes his visit to London in the last week of September 1980, the week before the announcing of the joint resolution and Prime Minister Trudeau's address to the nation on the 2nd of October. The four-man Canadian team in these discussions with the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, the FCO, and with Britain's principal parliamentary draftsman, consisted of the Deputy Minister of Justice and three officials, Strayer and another Justice Department official, and the legal advisor to the Department for External, of External Affairs, as it was then called. Strayer tells us that he had objected to the inclusion of this External Affairs official. I quote, on the ground that this was not a matter of external affairs, since in this respect the Parliament of the United Kingdom was acting as our domestic legislator. He goes on, the law applicable was not international law, but domestic law, on which the Department of Justice was the authorized source of advice." Unquote. Although this view did not prevail in the picking of that Canadian team, and although it is a view to which Strayer himself unfortunately did not then and does not now consistently adhere, his expressing of it on that occasion powerfully suggests to me that the background paper came from the justice stable, not external affairs. Be that as it may, the background paper's general line of argument moved plausibly towards its firmly stated and reiterated conclusions. I quote, at the present time in Canada, the degree of provincial concurrence needed on matters of constitutional change has not been finally defined. But whatever the force of different arguments over the proper usage or practice regarding provincial involvement in the amending process, it remains strictly a matter of internal concern to Canada, of no concern to either the UK government or the UK parliament. The British Government and Parliament must accept the constitutional validity of a request coming from the Canadian Parliament and not look behind the request or question it in any manner, 
To do otherwise would amount to second-guessing the views of a sister parliament within the British Commonwealth and would constitute interference in internal Canadian affairs. And then a little later, or in fact immediately, conclusions. A, B, C, D. By constitutional convention and by reason of Canada's sovereign status, one, the British Parliament cannot act to amend the Canadian Constitution except when requested to do so by the federal authorities. Two, the British Parliament is bound to act in accordance with a proper request from the federal government and cannot refuse to do so. E, the British Parliament or government may not look behind any federal request for amendment, including a request for patriation of the Canadian Constitution. Whatever role the Canadian provinces might play in constitutional amendments is a matter of no consequence as far as the UK government and Parliament are concerned." Unquote. And these conclusions were in line with the views of British governments, Labour and Conservative alike, during the previous decade at least. Indeed, by December 1980, British ministerial statements in the Westminster Parliament were employing, without openly quoting, the Canadian background papers closing formulae. The British Parliament is bound to act in accordance with a proper request from the federal government and cannot refuse to do so. The British Parliament or government may not look behind any federal request for amendment, including a request for patriation of the Canadian Constitution. In giving this detailed, not fully and publicly admitted support to the Canadian government's position, Mrs. Thatcher's ministers were carrying out the policy she had settled upon in late June 1980 on the occasion of Mr. Trudeau's visit to her to state his intention to patriate the Constitution within the year. She adhered to that policy, even though she came to feel imposed upon by Mr. Trudeau's failure at that 25th of June meeting to tell her that the Canadian formal request, when it came, might be strongly opposed by many provinces and that it would include not only patriation as such, but also an entrenched charter of rights, a constitutional innovation of a kind that she was opposed to introducing in and for Britain itself. We can now study her policy through the collection of confidential and secret government papers declassified in 2011 and 12 and marvelously accessibly displayed on the website of the Margaret Thatcher Foundation. She regarded it as strongly in the interests of the United Kingdom to accede to the Canadian government's requests and intended at all times to push the, Canadian, the whole Canadian patriation package through the British Parliament regardless of opposition to it in Canada. But matters did not unfold quite as Trudeau and Thatcher intended and their officials and advisers on the whole expected. When the Conservatives won the British general election in 1978, they introduced an innovation into the House of Commons. Standing select committees of backbenchers from each major party appointed under a standing order of the House to examine the expenditure administration and policy of major government departments. One of those, of course, is the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, the FCO. So there was established in 1979 a Foreign Affairs Committee of six Conservative and five Labour members with power to call for persons, papers and records and to appoint a special advisor for any, any particular inquiry. Someone, I quote from the standing order, with technical knowledge either to supply information which is not readily available or to elucidate matters of complexity within the committee's terms of reference, unquote. In 1980, for example, the Select Committee conducted a major inquiry into Western policy responses to the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. And when it recessed in August until the 29th of October, it was intending a new inquiry into British policy about Cyprus. During the recess, the FCO persuaded the committee's chairman, Sir Anthony Kershaw, a junior FCO minister in an earlier Conservative government, that stirring the pot in Cyprus would be unhelpful. So he was on the lookout for another subject for his committee's attention. And both he and a lively former legal academic among the Labour Party committee members, Kevin McNamara, whose parents had once lived for some years in Quebec, were approached by the Agent General in London for Quebec. Monsieur Gilles Loisel's campaign in Britain against the patriation package had begun on the 3rd of October with a letter to Mrs Thatcher, 
and through October he was steadily and agreeably, I believe, entertaining MPs at excellent tables. On Wednesday the 29th of October the committee resumed its work, resolved to postpone Cyprus and resolved further to investigate, in the words of its minute, the role of the United Kingdom Parliament in relation to the British North America Acts. The following morning, the clerk of the committee did two things. He wrote to the FCO asking for a memorandum dealing with the legal and constitutional issues involved and with HMG's, Her Majesty's Government's, advice to Parliament. And he drew up a short list of people who might serve as special advisor for this new inquiry. He phoned the first and second persons on his list, but they didn't answer. I was third, got the call in my teaching room in University College, Oxford, agreed to be considered, and noted in my diary that on the 30th of October I did one hour's work on the British North America Act. After another couple of hours' work on Tuesday the 4th, I showed up at the House of Commons, Westminster, at 9.30 on the 5th of, of, 5th of November. A resonant date, as we see, looking back to Guy Fawkes, under the house in 1605, and forward to the 5th of November 1981 in Ottawa. I was interviewed by nine members of the committee who that morning appointed me to assist them as the special advisor. I would have told them that I am an Australian whose Oxford doctoral thesis was half on Australian federal constitutional law, that I had written much of the chapter on constitutional law in each of the annual surveys of Commonwealth law published from Oxford between 1968 to 1976, with a good many pages on Canada, and had written up the Constitution of Canada, including the most major Canadian constitutional cases since 1867, for the 275-page chapter on Commonwealth constitutions for the practitioner's 45-volume textbook, Palsbury's Laws of England, published in 1974 and updated by me annually since then. And that I had once had occasion to study the extensive proceedings of a joint committee of the House of Lords and House of Commons, appointed in 1935 to consider the petition of the state of Western Australia to the British Parliament to arrange for the secession of the state from the Australian Federation. Clark gave me the FCO memorandum dated 4th of November 1980, laying out for the committee the basic parameters of the history of amendments of the BNA Acts, some notes recording Canadian approaches to the British government since the Quebec referendum of May 1980, the text of the joint resolution of the 2nd of, November, of October, and of the addresses to Canadians by Mr. Trudeau and Mr. Clark, and of recent British ministerial statements to Parliament, whose content I summarised and quoted a few minutes ago. The four FCO lawyers and researchers responsible for this memorandum would appear before the committee at 10.15 of the following Wednesday, 12th of November, and I would, I would prepare questions to be addressed to them by the chairman, other members devising their own questions and cross-examination. Meanwhile, perhaps that evening, I drafted 15 questions which were sent to the FCO, who replied in writing to 11 of them the day before their 12th of November examination. As their memorandum had foreshadowed, the FCO lawyers, when they came, showed themselves to be well prepared. They were unwilling to accept that any Canadian conventions, practices or usages about provincial consent were relevant to Britain's obligations or rights. They also would not, and were not pressed to, address in any way the question what the government's policy would be once the patriation package, the joint resolution, was actually sent over, if it was, to Britain by the Canadian Parliament. In mid-November, the Canadian government's timetable still envisaged that that would be on or about the 10th of December. But by the time our first independent witness appeared before the committee on the 3rd of December, it had been announced that the Joint Committee of the Canadian Houses of Parliament would extend its detailed consideration of the resolution, especially of the draft charter, until the 6th of February 1981, a relief for the Foreign Affairs Committee and for me. On the 26th of November, the committee resolved to hear only British expert witnesses and otherwise to receive only written submissions. Five Canadian provinces sent such submissions. Three of them were quite elaborate, above all British Columbia's, but also Newfoundland's and to a lesser extent Quebec's. 
that the High Commissioner for Canada wrote to the Chairman on the 3rd of December to decline the invitation, adding the suggestion that, I quote, whatever questions you may have in regard to the October 2nd, 1980 background paper should be considered in light of the fact that the position of the Government of Canada on the correct procedures regarding the enactment of the Canadian Parliament, as she put it, has not changed and will not change. That same day, we examined our first and perhaps most impressive witness. Drafting some, some of the questions put to Geoffrey Marshall was an agreeable experience. The first time I had met him was when he was the lead examiner and principal cross-examiner at the oral examination of my doctoral thesis 15 years earlier. <laughs> He had sent in, or brought with him, a finely constructed memorandum which anticipates a good deal of the general direction of our eventual report and outlines at a general level the vulnerability of the Canadian government's claim to have a unilateral right to demand an automatic UK enactment of whatever amendments of the BNA Acts the Canadian Parliament might request, regardless of provincial opposition. Geoffrey Marshall taught politics, not law at Oxford, but constitutional politics with a special eye to the politics of the former dominions, of the constitutional politics of the former dominions. And not long after the Patriation Affair, and perhaps inspired by it, he wrote an excellent book on constitutional conventions, which I shall quote from near the end of this evening's lecture. A week later, on the 10th of December, the committee examined Professor H.W.R. Wade QC, perhaps Britain's most prominent academic public lawyer, and for most of its existence, most of its existence, the general editor of the annual survey of Commonwealth law, and a senior colleague of mine in Oxford University's law faculty, but by, the, by now removed to, to Cambridge, as I mentioned at the beginning. I, really, I rarely saw quite eye to, hit, eye to eye with him on constitutional matters, often thinking him dogmatic. And his evidence to us pushed towards a slightly rigid conclusion, pushed the general argument developed by Marshall towards a slightly rigid conclusion. Still, Wade's was a powerful analysis, to quote a small fragment of it. The compact theory may or may not be fallacious, but that in no way alters or weakens the more limited principle that the division of powers between federal and provincial governments is something which the federal government ought not to have power to alter unilaterally. In fact, it is the basic principle of federalism, rather than any contractual or consensual arrangement between the various governments, which is the issue in the present controversy. It is a matter not of the federal compact, but of the federal principle. Section 7 of the Statute of Westminster 1931 was inserted at the instance of the provinces expressly for the purpose of preserving the federal principle, and so forth. These were crisp formulations, though not free from a touch of oversimplification. Our third and final expert witness was also from Cambridge University, where Wade was by then too, and like Wade, a Queen's Counsel, Elihu Lauterpacht, a practitioner in international law, who testified that same day, the 10th of December, that in inquiring whether a proposal for amendment of the Canadian Constitution had an appropriate degree of provincial consent, the UK Parliament would not be interfering in the domestic affairs of Canada. He explicitly took for granted that any underlying convention about the appropriate degree of provincial consent to any amendment, such as the patriation package of 2nd of October, must either be non-existent or demand unanimity. And, I quote, if provincial unanimity is a necessary precondition of the application to the United Kingdom Parliament, then all concerned in the application are entitled to know the relevant facts, unquote. And his memorandum said, when all is said and done, the amendment of the Canadian Constitution is a matter of Canadian constitutional law, in which there are three participants, the Federal Parliament, the provinces, and the United Kingdom Parliament, here acting in effect as an organ of Canadian constitutional machinery. There is but one Constitution of Canada, and the United Kingdom Parliament is, for a limited purpose, an essential part of it. There is therefore no element of interference in the domestic affairs of Canada when the UK, United Kingdom Parliament does just what the domestic law and convention of Canada require of it, namely, to ask whether there are conditions precedent to be satisfied and whether they have in fact been satisfied." Unquote. 
Mr. Lauterpark's examination was immediately followed by a second examination of the FCO, but this time the three FCO legal advisers accompanied a Minister of State, Mr. Ridley, not a cabinet minister but a senior and experienced politician nonetheless. I did not know, perhaps none of us did, that he had been at the 25th of June meeting with Mr. Trudeau and had there expressed even more strongly than Mrs. Thatcher the view that the British, I quote, if asked would have no choice but to enact the required legislation. His words before Mr. Trudeau adopted them. His goal on the 10th of December, of course, was to say as little as possible while professing the most expansive willingness to answer any and every question. <laughs> he held to the formula, rather deceptive as we now know, that the government was unable to say what it would do with a Canadian request until the request had been officially and definitively made. He also held to the well-tried formula repeated in Parliament only the day before by Mrs Thatcher that it would be in accordance with precedent for the government on receipt of the eventual request to introduce it into the UK Parliament and seek its enactment. In every case in the past it had done so. But the first of a set of questions which we sent him a few days earlier obliged him to make the admission that those precedents have not included one where the request reduces provincial powers and or is opposed by all the provinces. He would not, however, make the wider admission that provincial powers have never once been reduced without provincial consent. To justify that non-admission, he referred us to the factums, the written submissions made by the two sides in the Court of Appeal of Manitoba, the first of the three references to the courts that the premiers of six provinces had agreed in mid-October to launch in Manitoba, Quebec and Newfoundland. This non-admission, I considered, obliged me to delve into the records of every incident of which it might be said that provincial powers had been reduced without provincial consent. This I did in the fine branch of Oxford's University Library dealing with imperial and post-imperial history, Rhodes House, during the weeks up to and after Christmas. As the 60 close printed pages and 135 paragraphs of the report began to take shape, the full committee met to consider it on the 17th of December. Six members attended for a further consideration the following day, four on Tuesday the 13th of January, nine on the 14th, six late on the 15th, and nine for the decisive meeting on the 21st of January 1981, at which the whole report was read through, formal amendments were moved and voted on, and the committee's conclusions, which are enumerated summary and crisply in the 12 subparagraphs of paragraph 14 and are more discursively and reflectively articulated in paragraphs 111 to 115, were given their final shape and the whole document ordered to be published forthwith. The clerk and I spent the following day making that possible and the printed version was delivered to interested parties and governments and news agencies on the 30th of January 1981. I'll summarise now the essential conclusions in the barest outline and discuss them further in the final part of my lecture. Paragraph 111. The UK Parliament is not bound, even conventionally, either by the supposed requirement of automatic action on federal requests, or by the re supposed requirement of unanimous provincial consent to amendments altering provincial powers. Instead, the UK Parliament retains the role of deciding whether or not a request for amendment or patriation of the BNA Acts conveys the clearly expressed wish of Canada as a whole, bearing in mind the federal nature of that community's constitutional system. In all ordinary circumstances, the request of the Canadian government and parliament will suffice to convey that wish. But where the requested amendment or patriation directly affects the federal structure of Canada and the opposition of provincial governments and legislatures is officially represented to the UK authorities, something more is required. Paragraph 113, four lines in which are italicized. The role involves a responsibility in relation to Canada as a federally structured whole. It is not a general responsibility for the welfare of Canada or of its provinces and peoples. It is simply the responsibility of exercising the UK Parliament's residual powers in a manner consistent with the federal character of Canada's constitutional system. Now underlined, inasmuch as that federal character affects the way in which the wishes of Canada on the subject of constitutional change are to be expressed, it would be quite 
quite improper for the UK Parliament to deliberate about the suitability of requested amendments or methods of patriation, or about the effects of those amendments on the welfare of Canada or any of its communities or peoples." Unquote. And the truth is that the suitability or unsuitability of the Charter or of having any Charter played no part whatsoever in our deliberations or in the development of our arguments and conclusion. In his memoirs, carefully written up before his death in 1998 and published in 2002, the Canadian Minister of External Affairs, Mark McGuigan, who as a former constitutional law professor had taken very close interest in the patriation process, wrote, the work and report of the Select Committee on Foreign Affairs of the 30th of January 1981 was an unmitigated disaster for the federal government. He does not say whether the government took steps to mitigate it, but it did. And the steps it took are recounted in a fashion by Barry Strayer's book, which tells how he had prepared for this day, Strayer, by commissioning on the 9th of January a written response to be composed in the first instance by Professor Dale Gibson, fresh from arguing the government's case in the Manitoba Court of Appeal. Gibson and Strayer arrived in London on the 18th of February to discuss the draft response with the FCO. The response had already, recalls Trey, been re reviewed, I quote it, re been reviewed in Ottawa by many players and sent to the FCO in London for their reactions, unquote. The FCO, he says, generally had few problems with our draft. We returned home, got ministerial approvals and sent it for translation. It was published in early summer. Early summer. When's that? Two pages on, he describes a seminar of important Canadian and British patriation players held at All Souls College, Oxford, on the 8th and 9th of May. He and Professor Gibson were there and described, he says, our pending publication, the role of the UK Parliament in the amendment of the Canadian Constitution. So he represents that document's publication as occurring sometime in May or June. About its reception or impact, he says nothing at all, save this. I am not sure the paper ever received much attention in Britain, except from those who were already favourably disposed to our project. Well, I can tell you that the paper, the role of the United Kingdom in the amendment of the Canadian Constitution, received intense attention from the Foreign Affairs Committee the moment it was published. And that was not in June, not in May, nor even April, but on the 30th of March. The title page says simply March 1981. Mrs Thatcher received her copy from the Canadian High Commissioner on the Tuesday the 31st of March, and I think I got my copy from the committee clerk on Monday the 30th. I met the committee on Wednesday, April Fool's Day. The members were dismayed and depressed and looked reproachful. The 54 pages in the Canadian response, published in English and French under the name of and with a preface by Jean Chrétien, Minister of Justice, scathingly denounced the committee's report for its regrettable misunderstandings and misconstruing of the Canadian constitutional situation both internally and in its relation to the United Kingdom. The committee had heard only one side of the argument, had been greatly influenced by witnesses guilty of errors of fact, consequently given the crucial short shortcoming that its members had no personal experience of Canadian law or history or constitutional practice, every major component of the committee's position can be shown to be mistaken. <laughs> and what do we do now? As I explained to the members, we were actually in good shape. Our report had gone unscathed. The Canadian paper had found no error of fact or law or history in any of the many things we had said, and every one of the paper's own, uh, own arguments could be not merely parried, but refuted, for it had everywhere overlooked entirely the two fundamental and indubitable distinctions on which our report explicitly rested between amendments which affect the powers, rights or privileges of provincial authorities and those which do not, and between reviewing the suitability for Canada of Canadian requests and reviewing the compliance or non-compliance of the making of the request with constitutional convention or principle relating to the process of making requests for amendment. And the paper's theory that in these matters the UK authorities were nothing but part of the outside world with which Canada has relations through its national government was incoherent and indefensible. 
So the committee could easily, I said, and quickly produce a supplementary report devoted to refuting the Chrétien pamphlet and reiterating and reinforcing all our first report's main arguments and conclusions. The members' demeanour changed and they greeted the prospect with some relish. They met to review the draft supplementary or second report on the 8th of April and on the 15th approved it for its 22 close printed pages for publication. An article about its publication in the London Times on Saturday 25th of April stated in its two column headline, one of the new report's main messages. The Canadian federal government's position about automatic compliance with requests was, quote, inherently unreasonable. In his account of the All Souls seminar in early May, at which I was not present, Strayer says that he had the dubious pleasure of meeting Sir Anthony Kershaw and found Kevin McNamara unrestrained, vehement, and vociferous. <laughs> Professor Strayer adds at this point, now retired Justice Strayer, that, that the whole British scene made me angry as a Canadian, seeing British politicians and academics occupying themselves with matters on which they had little information and nothing at stake." Unquote. We could be quite sure that McNamara had repeatedly pointed to the comprehensive answer with which the gibson strayer Chrétien document had been met only a fortnight before. But all this need not be taken too seriously. The London-Oxford end of the patriation exercise had by this time been left rather becalmed, a backwater. For between sending our supplementary report to the government printer and getting it back, the Canadian cabinet which even on the 16th of April was resolved to have the joint resolution passed and sent to London before the Supreme Court had given judgment, or if possible before completion of oral arguments in court, changed course. All proceedings in Parliament in Ottawa uh, were adjourned pending the decision of the Supreme Court. As the week-long hearing of the appeals and cross-appeals from Manitoba, Quebec and Newfoundland began on 28th of April, everyone's attention, rightly, shifted away from sideshows like ours and onto the Supreme Court. The final words of our own second report to the House of Commons in Westminster were, I quote, any judgment of the Supreme Court of Canada to the extent that it deals with the matters we have canvassed is bound to weigh heavily with, our, with your committee and with the House. The federal government's change of course on or about the 23rd of April was the final defeat of a tactical policy and plan that Strayer's memoirs describe and endorse with amazing frankness. Referring to a memorandum of legal advice composed by him and his Justice Department colleagues in consultation with leading practitioners and with Professor Peter Hogg of Osgood Hall and visitor here in, in August 1980, Strayer says, Another reason for speed in October-November 1980 was given by the government's legal advisers, specifically that it would be best to have the measure through Westminster before Canadian courts had the opportunity to rule on any questions raised about the constitutional conventions. Nothing would persuade a court more that we were pursuing an acceptable route than Westminster's acknowledgement of its ability and obligation to accede to, Can to Canada's request. Unquote, or as he also says, it was a premise of our advice that the chances of getting a favourable decision from the Supreme Court would be greatly enhanced if the UK Parliament had already acted on a request from the Parliament of Canada and legislated the patriation package. He adds, my advice in effect was, borrowing from Shakespeare, if it were done when it is done, then twere well it were done quickly. The borrowing, as you know, is from Macbeth's advice to himself to get on with the unilateral, though joint, action of assassinating the blameless King Duncan. Had British MPs been aware just how far they were expected to be unwittingly complicit in an ice-cold strategy of fait accompli, of both upending Canadian constitutional conventions and circumventing the courts, they might have been more indignant than they were at the, the, at the demand that they be hitmen and more ironical than they were about the federal government's declaration in its background paper of the 2nd of October aimed at them that constitutional conventions consist of, I quote, customs, practices, maxims or precepts which although not enforceable by the courts nonetheless govern the workings of the constitution. 
Uh, it goes on, it is clear that by constitutional convention, provincial authorities have not standing to directly request on their own behalf that the British government refuse to pass an amendment to the constitution. The British government, in accordance with correct constitutional convention, will decline to act on any such provincial requests." Unquote. But as things turned out, the British Select Committee's very different assessment of the conventions in both its first and its supplementary reports was in the hands of the Supreme Court justices by the end of oral argument on the 4th of May. As I don't need to tell you, the Supreme Court's judgment on the 28th of September contained three rulings. One, unanimously, that the patriation package affected federal-provincial relationships and the powers of the provincial legislatures and governments. Two, by seven to two, that the agreement of the provinces is not legally required for such amendments, but three, by six to three, that there is a constitutional convention, which is a, quote, rule of the, Cana of the Canadian Constitution, unquote, that no request will be made to the UK Parliament without, quote, at least a substantial measure of provincial consent, unquote. A measure or degree that need not amount to unanimity, but is not achieved by a request which, like the current patriation package, eight provinces oppose. On Monday the 5th of October, Mr Trudeau met Mrs Thatcher for 35 minutes at the British Consulate in Melbourne, Australia. And she undertook, in the words of the minute signed by the Foreign Secretary Lord Carrington and telexed on the 6th of October to London and Ottawa, that her government, quote, would do what they were asked by the Canadian government and parliament to do. And their object would be to get the measure through with the greatest possible degree of support. The British government would want to deal with it as soon as they could and to deal with it effectively, unquote. The minute reports that Mr. Trudeau said he would negotiate with the provincial premiers, offering to weaken or narrow the Bill of Rights, but would be rebuffed by Quebec and Manitoba, and expected then to get the joint resolution through his parliament and off to London by about the 20th of October. Mrs. Thatcher said her government's, quote, first task would be to revise the draft reply to the report by the Select Committee on Foreign Affairs. The Telex Minute ends 15. Mr. Trudeau said that when one was going to do something that was right, there was nothing to be gained by procrastination. The fight could not get worse, and therefore it had better be brought to a conclusion. Canada had poured decades of mental and physical energy into this question, which had been under consideration for 54 years. The time had come to get it behind them, so as to liberate the energies of Canada to make the most of its potentials for the future. A pre-prepared joint press statement by the two Prime Ministers gave a slightly less stark version of this agreement, referring, as indeed Mrs Thatcher did in her opening remarks, to the likelihood of backbench opposition. That same Monday and all that week I worked on analysing and summarising the Supreme Court's decision and on preparing a draft document for consideration by the committee when it resumed on 21st of October. As was provisionally agreed at a short 90-minute meeting that day, the committee would publish a third report and would meet on the 9th of November to amend and approve it. It would say that the Canada Act bill should not be passed. The unconstitutionality of the making of the request by the Canadian Parliament against provincial opposition of the preponderance 8-2 firmly persisting on the 21st of October had been affirmed in terms strikingly similar in appearance by both the Supreme Court and the Select Committee. Though every judgment in the Supreme Court had carefully abstained from saying anything about the position of the UK Parliament. That was our informally resolved position on the 21st of October. On the 22nd of October, the Foreign Secretary Lord Carrington met Mr McGuigan by prior arrangement in Mexico. McGuigan's memoirs record, Carrington let me know that the British government had reluctantly come to the conclusion that it could not assure the package of the, joint ad the passing of the joint address in the current circumstances. Backbench opinion was just too intransigently opposed for even the whips to make a difference. I passed it on to the Prime Minister at once as a serious assessment. Carrington's view was later confirmed by a story in The Guardian on the 30th of October to the effect that there was no Commons majority for the measure and that the British government was reconciled to possible defeat. 
the situation in the British Parliament was undoubtedly a significant factor, this is still McGinn speaking, in the PM's willingness to compromise at the Federal Provincial Conference he called for the 2nd of November, unquote. And compromise he, the Prime Minister, did on the 5th of November. The post-patriation amending formula was changed, eliminating referenda, and in other ways, and Section 33 was introduced into the Charter to allow five-year overrides of some of its main provisions. In return, seven of the so-called Gang of Eight provinces dropped their opposition to the Charter. Even Premier Sterling Lyon of Manitoba, who had consistently, lucidly, and even eloquently opposed the transfer of Canada's polity to the rulership of judges. He signed subject to a reservation, but electoral defeat a fortnight later took matters out of his hands. About Quebec, there is no need for me to say anything just yet. So we met on the 9th of November against a wholly transformed backdrop. And our actual third report, approved on the 22nd of December, the day the Bill for a Canada Act was given its formal first reading in the House of Commons, expressed the judgments that, five, the proposals come before the UK Parliament with a degree and distribution of provincial concurrence which substantially satisfies the criteria we suggested in our first report. Parliament, we said, would be justified in, in regarding as sufficient a level and distribution of provincial concurrence commensurate with that required by the least demanding of the formulae which have been put forward by the Canadian authorities for a post-patriation amendment similarly affecting the federal structure. <coughs> the relevant post-patriation amendment formula in the present bill requires support by at least seven provinces which together have at least 50% of the population. Six, the Supreme Court has stated, it will be for the political actors, not this court, to determine the level of provincial consent required, unquote. The, the Federal Provincial Agreement of the 5th of November 1981 appears to us to amount to a determination by the political actors in Canada that the concurrence of nine provinces is constitutionally sufficient, albeit the dissenting province be Quebec. Seven, in this situation, what we said in our first report seems applicable. The UK Parliament is bound to exercise its best judgment in deciding whether the request in all the circumstances conveys the clearly expressed wishes of Canada as a federally structured whole. In our view, the present request does this. By the 25th of March, the Canada Act Bill had passed both houses, and on the 29th of March, the 115th anniversary of Queen Victoria's assent to the BNA Act 1867, it received the royal assent. It was proclaimed in effect in Ottawa on the 17th of April, 1982. So the path or road to the Charter had a fork that opened up on the 5th of November, 1981. We know what, way, what lay along the road then taken you are on it still. The other was not taken and cannot be known. But it appears to me as to others that if the provincial premiers, or most of them, had refused the Trudeau compromises as essentially meagre, his government would have proceeded, the resolution would have arrived in London in late November, the Foreign Affairs Committee's projected third report would, I think, unanimously have recommended its defeat on constitutional grounds, and though fierce pressure would have been applied by the whips of a government then, before the Falklands War and recapture, quite weak, with a slim parliamentary majority reversible by a few defections, I think it is more probable than not that the Canada Bill would have been defeated. As Geoffrey Marshall wrote in his 1984 book, Constitutional Conventions, no majority could have been found in either house of the British Parliament to enact a measure declared by the Supreme Court of Canada to be in violation of the constitutional practice of Canada. Indeed, the British government had been secretly preparing for such a contingency since at latest early October, when the cabinet secretary, briefing Mrs. Thatcher for her meeting with Mr. Trudeau the following day in Melbourne, wrote, doubtless encapsulating much internal deliberation within the government, I think that there are two possibilities that we ought to consider. 
A, that the bill gets a second reading, but an amendment at committee stage to delete the Charter of Rights is successful. B, that the bill fails at second or third reading. I believe that if the Charter of Rights is deleted at committee stage, we had better complete and pass the truncated bill with the patriation and amending formula provisions. If the bill fails at second reading, I believe that we should then consider the immediate introduction, not on Canadian request, but on our own initiative, of another bill containing only the patriation and amending formula provisions. Either of these courses would be in breach of the Constitutional Convention that the Westminster Parliament can act only on the request of the Canadian Parliament and cannot vary or modify the provisions requested. But the Canadian Government could hardly complain at our breaching that Convention when they were themselves in authoritatively confirmed breach of the Convention about obtaining provincial agreement for any measure which altered the federal provincial balance of powers. And either course would have the great advantage of divesting Westminster of its last vestiges of colonial responsibility in this field and putting responsibility for Canadian constitutional issues where it unquestionably belongs in Canada. Leaving aside those contingency plans or proto-plans, there might even have been a fourth Foreign Affairs Committee report because at the time of the tabling of the Canadian requested bill, the government would certainly have delivered its long-delayed response to our first report and would have tried forcefully to do what the background paper of October 1980 and the Chrétien Strayer Gibson response of March 1981 had unsuccessfully attempted and the committee would doubtless have responded in the thick of what would by then have been a truly fraught situation. So let me conclude with a few reflections on the central intellectual issue involved. We can start perhaps with Mr Trudeau's famous diatribe against the six justices who found against him on conventions. Opening the Bora Laskin Library in 1992, with the most prominent and successful of the six sitting disconcerted in front of him, the former Prime Minister repeatedly referred to that majority's finding of a convention of substantial provincial concurrence in amendments affecting provincial powers as a blatant invention. Reluctant as I am to say so, there seems to me some truth in that accusation. But, you will say, didn't the Foreign Affairs Committee too conclude that there need not be unanimity but must be substantial provincial concurrence? It did. But it did so on a basis and from a perspective quite different from the courts. Our first report said, and I'm here summarizing uh, but by quotation, six pages of argumentation. 98. We do not wish to express any settled view on the question whether there is a convention or principle that the Cana underlined Canadian government and parliament should not make such a request without unanimous provincial concurrence. We think that the UK parliament would be properly exercising its responsibility if it took into account the evidence for such a principle or convention and if it took full notice of the outcome of the relevant Canadian litigation. But we do not think that that principle of unanimous concurrence, if it exists, determines the responsibilities of the UK Parliament. 102. We agree that there is, in a relevant sense, a single Canadian constitutional system within which the UK Parliament plays a responsible role. But we are not persuaded that that unique role is altogether determined by the conventions and principles applicable to other parties to the system, such as the Canadian government or parliament. 103. It may well be that by convention the provinces have acquired a right that the Canadian parliament shall not request certain sorts of amendments without their unanimous consent underlined, but it does not follow that the provinces have also acquired a right that the UK Parliament should not enact those amendments without their consent. It seems to us that all Canadians, and thus the governments of the provinces too, have, and have always had, a right to expect the UK Parliament to exercise its amending powers in a manner consistent with the federal nature of the Canadian constitutional system. We think that even if there is a convention of unanimous consent binding the Canadian government and parliament and the UK authorities are confronted with a request made in violation of that convention, 
the UK authorities are not bound to reject that request. This is not to say that the UK authorities in such circumstances would have a discretion to act as they please. Rather, they should act on the constitutional principle which seems to us to be the guiding thread through this labyrinth of history and politics. We state that principle in paragraph 106 below. The intervening two paragraphs seek to explain why the UK government and parliament were not, uh, quote, guardians or trustees of the rights of the provinces precisely as provinces. The six Australian states retained in the Statute of Westminster the right to request UK legislation without the concurrence of the federal parliament or government. And the 1935 Joint Committee considering Western Australian secession affirmed that in matters pertaining to an Australian state's powers, the UK Parliament could not, by constitutional convention, legislate without the request of the state authorities. And so we reach paragraph 106 which begins by pointing to the significance of the fact that the Australian federal constitution can be remodelled in Australia by legislation and referendum without involving Westminster. This, now I'm quoting 106, means that the UK authorities can insist on unanimous governmental concurrence in requests from Australia which affect any constitutional interest beyond the interests of the government or legislature making the request. And this insistence on unanimity will not result in constitutional paralysis of the Australian co community. This often stated requirement of unanimity will not frustrate what the Joint Committee of 1935 called the, quote, clearly expressed wish of the Australian people as a whole, unquote. Since on almost all matters there is available to the Australian people an alternative and workable procedure for giving effect to their clearly expressed wishes, underlined, the same cannot be said of Canada. 107. We do not believe it has ever been the policy of the UK Government and Parliament in their dealings with territories for which they retain a responsibility to recognise unconditionally any convention or principle which could indefinitely deprive the, principle, the people or communities of those territories of the opportunity of giving legal effect to constitutional changes clearly desired by those peoples. It goes without saying that where a community is federally structured, the expression of that clear desire in relation to some matters involves more than simply the resolution of majorities in the federal legislature. Unquote. That was all in the first report. In reading this, we should bear in mind that this talk of peoples, their territories and their desires is not simply the language of modern mass democracies. It is also substantially the language of, for example, St. Thomas Aquinas and of the 15th century English political theorist and judge, Sir John Fortescue, who expressly adopted some of Aquinas's concepts and re-articulated them in works which inspired Chief Justice Cook 150 years later to establish the separation of legislative from executive and executive from judicial power and thereby give decisive shape to modern constitutions and constitutionalism. The conclusions follow in paragraphs 111 and 113, which I quoted earlier, and then 114, which itself is summarized in paragraph 1410, which I'll quote the summary. It would be proper for the UK Parliament to decide that the request of the Canadian Government and Parliament did not convey the clearly expressed wishes of Canada as a federally structured whole because it did not enjoy a sufficient level and distribution of provincial concurrence. But Parliament would be justified in regarding as sufficient a level and as, as sufficient a level and distribution of provincial concurrence commensurate with that required by the least demanding of the formulae for a post-patriation amendment, similarly affecting that federal structure, which have been put forward by the Canadian authorities. Let me interrupt my reflections on the British Parliament's responsibilities to say that at this point in paragraph 114, we put a footnote quoting Mr. Trudeau's statement of 7th of November 1980, which incidentally reveals what seems to have been his basic motivation for having a charter, as well as, more transparently, his motivation for having the British enacted as quasi-robotic, no-choice agents of the Canadian Parliament. 
He said, I am convinced that there would never be an entrenched charter of rights, particularly there would never be entrenched educational language rights, if it weren't done now by the National Parliament, the last time, as it were, that we had a possibility of proceeding in this way to amend the Constitution. In other words, once we have a Constitution in Canada, whether it be with the Victoria formula or any other formula, we will never get anything saying that all Canadians are equal. Therefore, I think in this last time of going to Britain with the authority of the House of Commons and Senate, I think it is important that we put it, the Charter, in and it is in. Back to responsibilities. One of the sentences most important to me in my book Natural Law and Natural Rights is tucked away, which was 1980, is tucked away as the tail end of a longer sentence in a footnote in the chapter on authority. Authority is, in reason as in modern British constitutional draftsmanship, responsibility. You have heard me and Sir Robert Armstrong and others deploying that equivalence over a dozen times this afternoon. Authority is responsibility. And what the line of thought I have been reporting and developing over the last few minutes amounted to is this. The UK Parliament had, back then in 1988-82, not now, a responsibility to act within the framework of the Canadian constitutional order as defined by law and by presumptively binding conventions. But if it was to that extent an organ of the Canadian Constitution, it was in that position as part of the patrimony, so to say, of British imperial authority over and responsibility for the territory and peoples of Canada. And one last remaining aspect of that part of the patrimony shared by the two now in 1980 independent countries was that Britain could act to liberate Canada from its constitutional impasse if Britain's responsible authorities, intending to fulfil a residual responsibility for the Canadian people as a constitutionally structured whole, responsibly judged that there was indeed such an impasse and that it could responsibly be resolved by a once and for all act of equipping Canada with the means of of promptly thereafter internally resolving its impasse consistently with the wishes of the Canadian people as a federally structured whole. Is that what happened in the event? The obvious broad brush answer is no. What was done was done in line and in full compliance with a Canadian request that was itself made in line with the conventions. But is that answer quite right? Certainly what was done was nothing like what Armstrong's briefing note envisaged, unilateral British termination of UK powers and responsibilities along with a post-patriation amending formula desired by the federal parliament, but still being resisted by most of the provinces. But a closer look discloses, I think, that there was indeed an element of resort to the imperial patrimony of responsibility to exercise authority. For if it is true, as I believe it is, that first, the Canadian Supreme Court's majority had made up a convention of substantial provincial concurrence to replace the actual convention of unanimous concurrence, and if it is true, as it certainly is, that two, the degree of provincial concurrence on and after the 5th of November 1981 did not quite meet the criterion discerned by the Foreign Affairs Committee in its first report, namely that there be as much concurrence as in the least demanding of the post-patriation formulae accepted by Canadian players, a criterion not met because even the least demanding of such formulae required either the concurrence of Quebec or an opt-out facility for any non-concurring province. Then it follows that this also is true. Three, the UK Parliament in enacting the Canada Act 1982 was acting outside, just, just outside, the true Canadian constitutional rules relating to its action and thus was drawing for one last time on the residual overriding imperial, as, so to say, authority on which it had not had to draw since the 1860s or 1870s and in fact had not drawn in any of the many 20th century amendments it had enacted 
except perhaps, but to only to a trivial extent, in 1907, when the responsible minister overseeing the amendment was, as our first report extensively illustrates, Winston Churchill. This third truth, if truth it be, is buried more in plain sight than hidden in the paragraph of our third report certifying the post 5th of November package as one that substantially satisfies the criteria. That paragraph deliberately notes, but without any comment on the issue at stake, that the Quebec Assembly had as expressed its dissent and that in the post-patriation amendment formulae such dissent would entail the non-application of the amendment to Quebec. Many, of course, would say that this last step in my reflections is too scrupulous. The British were entitled in and after November 1981 to take the Supreme Court's rulings on convention at face value. And they did. So you have the Charter that, as Pierre Trudeau's remarks at his press conference of 7th of November 1980 assure us, when taken in concert with predictions and assessments such as those of Lord Carrington and Geoffrey Marshall, you would not have if the provincial premiers representing real elements in the complex desires of the Canadian people had held firm on the 5th, 4th and 5th November 1981. The act of self-determination made in Ottawa on that 5th of November was Canadian. And bearing in mind the constitution transforming contents of that act, the last words of the Foreign Affairs Committee's third and last report, drafted by one of the Labour members on the 22nd of December 1981, seemed even then, and more so now, to be less than completely sound as a matter of substance. Leave, leave aside the tinny style. Our respective nations and peoples will continue to hold in common the principles, practices, power, and potential of parliamentary democracy. Thank you very much.